Hmm. She's supposed to be here. I wonder where she got off to? Oh. Hello. You must be YouTube. Nice to meet you. I'm Destiny Marchand, and I was supposed to be delivering the research on the first half of today's video, but Ran seems to be late. I've got a whole presentation together, so if she's not here soon, I'll just do it myself. You could. That would be lovely. I need to get out of this armor and into some real clothes. Oh. Haran. Where have you been hiding? I had a problem that needed seen to. I still need a few minutes to wrap up the comments for the end of the video. If you want to take the first bit, it's okay with me. Sure, I can do that. Right here, or over in that office? Not much traffic just now, so pretty much wherever. Those cameras are good at dealing with strange locations, just send them back when you're done. Oh, and you might want to ditch the presentation. For these, we watch the video, and interrupt as needed to set the record straight. Is this going to be stupid? Is Lacey obsessed with hand baskets? Um, Ren? Can I just- Nope, too late. You volunteered, so off you go. As well, crap. Wasn't expecting that. Oh, well. Off we go then. Follow me, please. Just turn it off en route. There, that's better. Or at least a bit more comfortable. Alright then. Hello, YouTubers. Kage HS been busy the last few days dealing with a few rather pressing concerns, and asked me to do some research on channeling. It's not my field of expertise, understandably, but it was amusing to have a look and see what sorts of strangeness would filter out. The research alone turned up some strange things. From what I hear, this might just be stranger yet. So, without further ado, let's have a look. There are two primary ways of communicating with beings of higher consciousness. One is through astral projection, where you leave your physical body and communicate to them in person. As much as I'd love to break into astral travel right now, we have to save that for later. The other method involves having a being come to Earth and communicate through a trained person, and this is called channeling. Why not get into astral projection now? Is it some sort of scary secret that you don't get to know about until you reach a certain rank in the cult? I suppose we can make do with channeling, then. Channeling is a natural form of communication between humans and beings of higher consciousness, included but not limited to angelic beings, spirits of nature, non-physical entities, or even animals and pets. In a sense, it's basically when a human will turn him or herself into kind of like a phone for beings of higher consciousness and people to communicate. So the dog is on a higher level of consciousness. Also, I thought the whole angels thing was over. So pass say. Also, has you ever tried talking to a proper cat? They don't care what you want to talk about. You're there to serve them dinner, check the water bowl and sandbox, and stay out of their way. The dog might be slightly more interested but usually not by much. You're a clay pigeon launcher, carrier of the leash, and chef rolled into one ungainly upright package. I think your graphic here is particularly accurate there at the bottom of your speech bubble. This is Woo. Channeler can choose who or what they want to channel. As long as the other party has an interest in communicating, the link is made and the channeling can begin. Now don't worry, there's no possession or anything harmful taking place here. The body is still under the complete control of the channeler, but the channeler and spirit are communicating through thought. Messages are communicated on levels of emotion and thought rather than spoken word. The channeler will then decipher what the spirit tells him into human language. Con what? That didn't make any sense whatsoever. So there's no possession, but they talk to you, and you to an audience. Sound about right? Also, define an emotional level in this context, because I don't think that word means what you think it means. It seems to me that if anyone could channel, the spirit would simply speak to the audience directly. What does he need you for? Do you have to have special training? How do they know that you have it? What happens if they want to take over and speak directly through you? Is there not a possession going on then? You need to be at least internally consistent, never mind being consistent with the pile of ducks out there that make their living defrauding people and starting cults. Also, you seem to be missing a few words there in that last sentence. Contrary to popular belief, entities do not generally use human languages because it is considered awkward and clumsy. 
The majority of this message is conveyed through an elegant series of sensory feelings. Let sensory feelings? Language is a requirement for communications. It's not likely to be a strictly human's thing. If we were trying to communicate face to face with an insectoid alien, communication will be very awkward indeed. But that would require a translator that could replicate sounds of both species, as opposed to relying on supernatural phenomena to accomplish it. There's a reason it's called supernatural, after all. Let's talk about animal communication, because this is a form of channeling that you yourself can do. Channeling pets is one of the easiest forms of this art. Pets, of course, do not use human language, but they have a strong desire to communicate with humans. A small disclaimer, if you're planning on trying this, it's also helpful to charge your third eye chakra, as we talked about in lesson two. It will assist with your mental connection to them. You'll want to practice on a family pet before taking a leap to anything else. A cat or dog who is familiar with you is the best choice to begin. Cats are a tad more difficult because they tend to pick and choose what they want to listen to. A family dog can be easier as they are pack animals and will be more apt to tune in to the leader of the pack, which is you. So okay. We're supposed to take your first two lessons as read, and just accept that you even have a third eye. Right. I begin to see why some people are averse to you, Jordan. Well, at least those with the capacity for critical thinking greater than that of your average gerbil. Purple spinning wheel like vortex in my brain. Fine. But just for now. If this is nearly as stupid as it sounds, then we're going to have some issues. Well, let's go over some of the basic steps to do this. Start by taking your dog into a quiet room. Sit on the floor next to him, or if he's allowed on the couch or bed, have him sit next to you. Pet him in his favorite spot until he's settled in. Then start talking quietly to him in a loving tone. Find one short sentence or word and use it over and over. You could say, hey there sweetie, hey there sweetie, or okay buddy, okay buddy. Let's just call this your key phrase. When you've gone over your key phrase 10 times or so, close your eyes and be silent. Stop petting him and begin to form a picture in your mind of what you want him to know. You may have to practice visualizations if you haven't ever done this before. After the picture is formed and clear, float the image out of your forehead where your third eye is located and into your dog's head directly between the eyes. Once you've done this, speak the key phrase again one more time and float the image again into his head. Keep doing this until he either leaves to get up or puts his head on your lap. If he leaves, follow him and do it again. If you begin to get a reaction from him, like putting his head in your lap or something else, congratulations, you've just communicated with your dog. So the sign of communication with the dog is normal behavior. If I sit still long enough, the dog will want to play and will put her head in my lap to ask me to throw the ball. How about something more? Useful as an indicator of a result. Going and getting my robe, perhaps? Or maybe something exciting, like telling my partner that I need him to come back here from the office to rub my feet. Or something else I told him to do? Cats are a bit more stubborn, so it'll depend on the cat you're trying to communicate with. The image you're visualizing to him may have to be their favorite cat treat or something that they really like. If they're especially loving snuggle cats, then that's all the better. Use the same directions with the dog though, and who knows, you could be talking with them in no time. If you have smaller animals like avians and reptiles, you have to remember that the animal has a smaller brain. Their reception of pictures is apt to be slower and take longer. We have the largest brain size by body weight of all critters currently extant. They've all got smaller brains. Also, under no circumstances is the cat going to sit still while someone fondles it and tries to get the same response not happening. If you want to know what the cat's thinking, watch the tail. That will tell you exactly how many fucks it has to give about anything you might be trying to put across to it with non-existent telepathy. Remember, practice and patience is crucial to learning to do this. You'll probably start with minimal results, but if you're persistent, you will not only master the family pet chat, but other animals around you, like your friend's pets or pets in the car barking at you as you walk by and so on. One big question that everyone has around now, well, do they talk back? Yeah, they do. I communicate with my cat, Toonie, and he always tells me what he wants, whether it's food, water, or to go outside. It's called body language, and cats are good at it. They have a pay attention to me vocalization, and know how to look at the bowl and then back to you. If they're really hungry, they may climb up on you, rub on your leg, or what have you. That cat is not talking to you directly. I've actually read that horses are really good at communication as well. In an article I'll be posting in the comments of this video, a woman said that one time she had a horse specifically ask for a green apple, not a red one, had to be green. Of course, she immediately got one and gave it to her, and they started communicating more. No, it didn't. Horses are red slash green colorblind, and thus don't care what color an apple is. It's just sweet and tasty. Also, a domesticated animal taking food from a human is a normal part of their day. They think nothing of it most of the time. 
I know what you're probably thinking. Well, don't I have to be psychic to do this? Well, yes, but everyone is psychic, but most people don't really realize it. There's a gland in the brain called the pineal gland, which scientists have actually labeled the psychic gland. Through charging your third eye chakra, you begin to activate the pineal gland and your psychic connection can begin. Just remember to release the concept that you'll hear words and allow yourself to feel into your animal friend. So now we understand how to channel beings of lower consciousness, animals. For beings of higher consciousness, it's essentially the same thing, only reversed. In this scenario, we are like the animal and we are communicating with beings who know and understand far more than we do. So they're lower consciousness now? You said they were higher just a couple of minutes ago. Internal consistency, gerbil. You need to look into that. Really? Go on. Let's hear about beings of higher consciousness. Not like they'd care what we think either. Why talk to the primitive apes on an insignificant speck of metal hanging out around a strictly average main sequence star? You would think they'd have better things to do with their day. There are a plethora of channelings on the web that you can find. Some are really helpful, enlightening, and perceptive, and others are, well, not. It's More errors per minute than a processor chip with a floating point programming error. Every one of those people on the web fit into that last category. They're all out for your money, and there are plenty of ways to get cash out of rubs if you're dishonest enough. How many people claim to channel Yahweh? How many of them agree about what he wants? Pretty much. It's important that when you're listening to or reading channelings, that you use discernment with what you're listening to. For the most part, you have no idea who or what is being channeled, and the only way you can really truly tell is through listening to what they are saying and finding truth in their words. If what is being said feels right, then go with that flow. If it does not, then you don't have to subject yourself to it. The final decision will have to come from you, though. Everyone channels differently as well. Sometimes channelings are quite boring, as the channeler will just lay down and connect internally and just let the information fly. Other times, the connection between the beings is stronger, and they'll walk around the room and talk and be quite lively. So you leave something as critical as what bullshit to throw in with the people that are already listening to the con? Are you kidding me? Please tell me this is all one huge joke. Just because some are better actors than others means exactly what? Then there's people like this. I'm cutting all that out. That guy ate a factory of word salad and regurgitated it on his audience. If you want to see it, go to the original video, and click over to 4 minutes and 55 seconds. I'll have Ren put in a link in the description. Moving on. Now I gotta admit, that's actually pretty cool. And regardless of the excitement in the way he channels, the information is usually really good. Say what? Is there some new definition of information to which I am not privy? I must have missed a memo someplace. For those who are trying to channel entities on your own, I ask that you use caution when proceeding forward, but also have fun. There is a possibility that you encounter a negative entity who may try and trick you or steer you off course. For the most part, even the bad entities will act as good ones, because humans generally fall for it. I don't want to scare anyone away from this though. The universe is full of amazing, positive beings of light who are here to help us in our time of need. If you connect with a being that just fills you up with love and light inside, then feel free to establish a conscious connection and communicate with this being. Syrians and Pleiadians especially are known for being very loving and helpful. Syrian and Pleiadians? Int for legend life in the Pleiades? You do know that the Pleiades is an open star cluster, and spreading out, right? Those stars are very young. And if they have planets, they're probably molten lumps of metal, silicates and gases, and not particularly good as far as habitability. That entire region is actively forming stars. No way we get advanced life there. Sirius is a binary star system with no known planets, nor the perturbations that would suggest one. The chances for life there are remote indeed. Syrians come from Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. The Pleiadians come from the Pleiades, which is a cluster of stars through the constellation of Taurus. To learn more about this, I recommend reading the book Bringers of the Dawn, or listening to the audiobook, which is available on YouTube. A lot of the information in spirit science does actually come from channeling. A man named Drunvalo Melchizedek was visited by a being named Thoth, roughly 30 years ago, and worked with him personally for many years. We're going to be learning a lot about Thoth, who was the priest king of Atlantis for a very long time. Now you're well on your way to going full retard. Never go full retard. Melchizedek is a known charlatan, Thoth was the Egyptian god of knowledge, and Atlantis never happened. Plato made it up. If this is where you're getting your information, gerbil, then it's small wonder people with a proper education are laughing at you. He wrote about all of his experiences in the Emerald Tablets, which are ancient, unbreakable tablets which we discuss in Lesson 12. 
The whole Atlantis story came from him. I highly recommend, for those who are interested in learning more, check out The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life, the first book Drunvalo published about his experiences with Thoth, as well as 25 years of scientific research that works harmonically with what Thoth taught him. Science says this is correct? Somehow, I doubt that sincerely. Care to explain which 25 years we're talking about here? Did Thoth regurgitate what we already knew, or did he make testable predictions? If the latter, I should think I would have heard something. There's actually a being channeled named Cryon of Magnetic Service. He talks a lot about worldly events and what's going on on a global scale. What's interesting is that Cryon has been invited to the United Nations seven times over the last 13 years. If the UN listens to channeling, maybe it deserves a little more credibility than we realize. No, it means that there are people at the United Nations that are particularly credulous. Nobody cares about speaking engagements at the UN except feminists, and only then if it's Emma Watson prattling on about patriarchy theory. On my YouTube, I'm going to be posting small snippets from various channels, but most of them from Crimson Circle. Crimson Circle started out in 1999 when a being named Tobias started communicating with Jeffrey Hope. There's actually a really cool story here, I can't go over all of the details, but Tobias was actually written about in the Bible, in the book of Tobit. This particular book was removed by the church in 1546 during the Council of Trent. Tobias was written as one of the main characters in that book, and Jeffrey and him began communicating more. In 1999, Crimson Circle was formed, a group dedicated to communicating with Tobias and other spirits. Up until recently, it was mostly Tobias who was channeled by the Crimson Council. Tobias then said that he wanted to return to Earth and live another lifetime because he missed physical reality and said his goodbyes. Today, Adamus St. Germain is channeled instead, and he's very lively. A little insight on Adamus, he is what you would call an Ascended Master. An Ascended Master is someone who underwent a process of spiritual transformation and moved into higher states of being beyond physical life. This will make way more sense in future lessons. Maybe you should define your terms a bit better. You throw it out there posit them in an indescribable higher plane of existence, and then promise to cover it later. Regular viewers to your channel are no doubt still waiting for your second video on Shacross, years later. Your wall of photos lists a load of figures from various religions, most of which are violently opposed to one another. Okay, I want to wrap up by going over a short list of definitions. During the channelings, you may hear some words that you're not familiar with. Amyo is absolute and pure trust in the self, the realization of the I am. Makyo are kind of like lies that you tell yourself, that take you away from the I am, like I'm not good enough or I can't do it yet. Kind of like the opposite of Amyo. Ascension is the process of going from one lifetime to the next while staying in the same physical body. Kaldra, you may hear this one a lot actually. Kaldra is the nickname that Tobias gave to Jeffrey. So if you ever hear Jeffrey say during a channeling, Kaldra doesn't want me to say this, but I will anyways, that's Adamus speaking through Jeffrey, about Jeffrey, whose nickname is Kaldra. Is that confusing? Shambra is the name that Adamus uses for the group of humans going through the awakening process. If you're watching the videos, you too are a Shambra. Shoud is a channeling, essentially. What you'll be watching are Shouds, gatherings for communication with Adamus and other beings. Now you give us a bunch of terms, and half describe them, as specific to the Crimson Circle. You're prepping us for the next guest speaker full of word salad and I'm not going to bite. I'm going to cut that bit, too, as it's possible to watch it in the original video without me making snarky comments. The bullshit is thick enough you couldn't cut it with a nuclear-powered jackhammer. That's it for this lesson, apparently, and no super psychics. Oh, well. Can't have everything. For now, I'm going to send you back to Ren. She can have the next bit. As for me, I need a shower. No, I'm not going to leave the credits. I'll be back for other videos later. Until then. Know ye not that ye are gods. Hello, all you folks out there in YouTube land. Destiny says she finished the first lesson, and from the looks of things, she cut a few bits out. Links will be below so that you can have a look at the unedited pain. Now for the quote. Nope. I've got nothing. I can't even find a clear origin for the person being quoted. He seems to have been the originator of Hermetic tradition, a mix of Hermes and Thoth, the Greek and Egyptian deities of knowledge. Beyond that, not much is known for certain. So, without a proper source, we can discard this altogether. Better get some popcorn ready, this one's gonna be pretty long. What we're going to be talking about today is something that will be very important in the next few lessons. The topic is male and female energy. From there, we'll be talking about left brain and right brain, then the new children, and bring it full circle. 
Ready? Deep breath. A few weeks ago, we touched upon chakras and how they're at the source of what's affecting your internal systems. What we didn't talk about was the energy flowing within them. Now, there's lots of kinds of energy through and around all of us, and that'll be a future topic later on. Today, I wanna to talk about two specific energies that can be expressed through this image. The energy that flows here is male and female energy. Male energy is focused, and female energy is creative and random. You can say what you like, but I doubt very seriously that the concepts behind yin and yang are of any value beyond the mysticism that gave the concept birth in ancient Korea. To those people, women were inherently evil, dark and stupid. Men, on the other hand, were light and sublime. Neither of them is greater nor weaker than the other, and both can be extremely powerful when fully manifested. Female energy is the land of unbridled possibilities, creative potential, and affecting the universe from within. Focused male energy takes direct roads from point A to point B. This energy can be as strong as a tank, accomplishing tasks and going where it needs to go with precision and without distraction. The important thing to know about this energy is in how they move. I'm going to use some super basic sacred geometry to demonstrate this. Sacred geometry. How does that differ from regular geometry? Oh, right, in the amount of we required to see what the child with the fuzzy felts is talking about. This is the Fibonacci spiral. We're gonna be talking a lot more about it when we dive into the topic. For now, all you have to know is that it starts at one and flows outward forever in a very specific way and is present in all life everywhere. As male energy flows through the spiral, it goes from base point to point, from here to here, to here to here. It doesn't curve, it just goes straight where it needs to be. Wouldn't that be inefficient, especially at the end? Didn't you just say that male energy was about efficiency? Female energy, however, would flow in the actual spiral. It would go around, going in and around outside all of the lines, but still getting to the same or similar results. This is the graphic representation of how it flows, but it also acts in the same way. From this understanding, you can see how we use these energies in our lives. It's the difference between driving straight to work and being on schedule all the time, and taking the scenic route because it's a more pleasant ride, even if it means being late. It's baking a cake strictly by what it says in the cookbook and putting it together with what just feels right. It's getting that promotion for working the hardest and getting that promotion for coming up with the best ideas. Here's a relatable example. It's the difference between Inception and Sucker Punch, both about dreams, but one of them being the masculine story of professional men just doing their no-nonsense work, trying to get the job done, and the other being the feminine story that was creative and random and, according to many, didn't make much sense. Sucker Punch didn't make a lot of sense regardless because it was the story of a psychologically damaged young woman in the last hours before someone shoved a chisel up her nose. Inception made even less sense in its own deranged way. Wait, did you just use two movies to describe science? Both male and female energy, like the chakras, have their own traits. Male energy is linear, analytical, strategic, and practical. However, when male energy is constricted, it is very blundering and confrontational, and what tends to occur is not seeing all sides of a situation, or not being open to any other possibility other than the one being pursued. You can see a lot of that in today's society. Most commonly, we call it being closed-minded. Minds are closed. That will take the first comfortable twee explanation offered to them, and not bothering to look into anything. A mind that stops asking questions is one that is forever closed to the wonders of the universe. Female energy, on the other hand, moves in curves. It does not stay inside the lines. It is creativity and movement and expression and emotion. It can do anything and go anywhere, but it has trouble sticking to schedule. If constricted, it can get out of its flow, running rampant between emotions and mood swings and ideas. The creativity could get jumbled and come out as an out of control mess. So having too much female energy makes one subject to rampant emotionality and mood swings. Sounds like me and every woman I know four to seven days out of the month. You pulled both descriptions out of your ass, based on watching the interplay between mum and dad, didn't you? We don't have this widespread issue in today's society, and it has a lot to do with our brain hemispheres. We're gonna look at that in a moment. One big difference between the two is that male energy looks at parts and female energy looks at holes. You have evidence to back up that assertion. I happen to like tearing things down to see how they work whilst Destiny's partner Jack likes to play with the neat toys and could care less what went into making it. Am I just too masculine, then? Before I go on, I wanna make this clear. Male and female energy has very little to do with sexual orientation. Like, it's in the mix, but it's not a fundamental part of the energy itself. For example, if you look at the shape of male and female bodies, 
Men have straighter bodies, women have curvier bodies. We'll probably come back to this in the lesson down the road. Yes, I have curves. What difference does that make? And what does sexual orientation have to do with it? I think I feel an imbalance of female energy coming on. Okay, brain hemispheres. We have two of them. And if you remember what you learned in grade 10 biology, this will be familiar. The left brain is the male energy side of the brain. It is orderly, statistical, logical, and mathematical. It sees things in straight lines, rational and practical. The right brain is the female energy side of the brain. It is our creative side, a free spirit. It is passion and experience of taste and feeling, movement and art. As is the same with the energy, the left brain cannot make sense out of the right brain. You cannot put feelings and expressions within boxes. They must be felt to be truly experienced. The right brain too cannot make sense about how the left brain understands things. Right. And where is the peer-reviewed study that that says that the sides of our brains have specific male and female energy? Okay, so as a species, we are primarily left-brained. Well, incredibly left-brained. This basically means that as a species, we essentially have a male energy imbalance. There is way too much of it. It is dominant and is constricting on the female side of the brain. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't a bad thing. In fact, it's kind of a blessing in disguise. But we have to talk about some other things first. No, you're going to support that assertion now. Wait, no you're not. You're going to carry on with your word salad and evidence-less claims. So, there's nothing wrong with our female energy. We're just not really using it to potential. Our male energy is really messed up, and that's why we're where we are right now. By where we are, I mean the economical, political, financial, religious, nuclear, dolphin and bee-killing global war crisis. So everything wrong with the world can be blamed on male energy, then. Why does that sound like you're using some Radfem's creed rather than writing your own material? After lesson one, I touched upon how right now the world is a mess in a myriad of areas. A few people commented saying, well, study the financial crisis and study the nuclear crisis and study the political crisis. They're all completely separate issues. And this is how the male energy looks at parts. We're realizing now that it's constricting on our point of view. As a whole, all of these issues together are further proof that we don't understand how to be harmonious because our male energy is out of sync with each other and the planet. That sounds lovely, Jordan. So how do you get out of sync with a planet? It's an inanimate object that happens to be covered in living matter. So let's look at indigo children and super psychics. There's a new type of children being born on Earth. Since sometime in the 80s, new children started appearing with different or unusual traits. Their numbers began to increase, and today, nearly 100% of all children born in North America are indigo children. So what are these traits? Let's go over a list developed by Jan Yordi, a play therapist who has been studying and working with indigo children for about four years now. As we go over the list, see if any of these sound like you. Maybe strong-willed, independent thinkers who prefer to do their own thing rather than comply with authority figures or parents. Have a wisdom and level of awareness and caring beyond their youthful experience. Traditional parenting and discipline strategies don't appear effective with these children. If you try and force an issue, a power struggle is the typical outcome. Energetically, indigos are vibrating at a much higher frequency, so they can get scrambled by negative energy easier. Emotionally, they can be very reactive and may have problems with anxieties, depression, or temper ages if not energetically balanced are creative right brain thinkers, but may struggle to learn in a traditional left brain school system. Often indigos are diagnosed as having ADD and ADHD since they appear impulsive. This is because their brain can process information faster and they require movement to help keep them focused. Indigos are very intuitive, often psychic and may hear, see, or know things that seem unexplainable. Indigos may have more problems with food or environmental sensitivity since their system is more finely tuned. When their needs are not met, these children appear self-centered and demanding, although this is not their true nature. These children have incredible gifts and potential and may be shut down when not properly nurtured and accepted. So what's causing this? Well, for one, there are two new DNA blocks being activated within these kids. They are microcephalin and ASPM. Both of these blocks are designed to regulate brain growth, giving the kids a broader spectrum of thinking and a newer way of learning. The you gave us a list of things to look for when trying to diagnose oneself or one's children as indigo. The first, third, fourth, 10th and 11th are things that kids that are not regularly beaten within an inch of their little lives will exhibit. This is because they have the room to explore and work out who they are. Social sciences have been pushing alternative discipline strategies since the 60s, and the subsequent rise of technology, and that's what you get. The second one is the imagination of your source, as all small children are like that when treated with love and care. The fifth is the result of poor parenting. Six and seven are typical of sufferers of ADHD. Eight cannot be proven, and is at best the product of someone's cosmic ring piece, 
and the fine-tuning argument to explain picky eating is a waste of my time and yours. They're bloody children, and co-opting normal behavior to forward your narrative is vile and disgusting. Because of this, the average IQ of an indigo child is about 140, which is 40 to 50 points higher than the average IQ. We're just learning now that our school system's methods of teaching are becoming outdated. It's because our kids are changing. We're going to look at the broader spectrum of why this is happening in a moment. So the average child is qualified for Mensa. I find that very difficult to believe. For now, let's move on to the badassery that is the super psychics. These kids are hardcore. They can do anything, literally. Some can move solid objects through walls with their minds. Some are blind, yet they can see everything around them from a myriad of different screens within their head. There are some who can look at a person and know absolutely everything about a person just from looking at them, including when they'll die. So why haven't we heard about this? You think this would be huge in the world? Yes, Jordan, tell us why we haven't heard about this. This, bollocks. Well, for one, almost all super psychic children are in China, and almost all of the evidence is hardly ever rendered into English. Most journals that I've ever read or heard about are published in English. Learning English and often at least some Latin is almost a requirement. Besides, don't the Chinese have interpreters? It would seem that if folks outside China can learn the language, they might have a few handy to do papers. Although some of it does make it into the public in China. If you want to learn more about this, the book China's Super Psychics by Paul Dong and Thomas Raphael is a great starting place. Before we wrap up, we totally have to bring this video full circle. Yes, please. I would really like to know if any of this can make any sense whatsoever. What on earth do the new children have to do with male and female energy? Isn't it obvious? Indigo children are directly connected to our species male energy and super psychics to our female. As we grow closer and closer to the peak of the shift, the planet itself is beginning to change. Essentially, this is happening to balance us out. On one half of the world, indigo children are being born. On the other half, super psychics. They are here to help the consciousness of the planet in an incredibly crucial time. There are way more indigo children on the planet than super psychics because it's our male energy that needs to understand. It's through the indigo children and their new way of thinking, which is affecting the consciousness of the planet, putting us back onto the harmonious path. As we just learned, to understand things, it takes two to tango. You can not only understand something by reading about it, you need both sides of the brain to click. In the modern world, things like astral projection and channeling aren't really considered science. With good cause, because it's irrelevant twaddle with no evidence to support it. As previously pointed out, the planet does not possess a consciousness but a web of living things on it, each dependent on the others. The planet isn't alive to care what happens, and even if it were, it knows it would survive the current crop of creatures, and new would arrive eventually. It's still got another couple of billion years before it's going to be destroyed, and it would even know how that would happen. One of them is exploring different realms outside of the body, and one is communicating with beings of higher consciousness. And yet, because we can only seem to measure it from experience, it doesn't qualify to be legitimate. Because of this left brain constriction, we have lost a major part of what life is about. See, what we have is called polarity consciousness. We see everything in two ways, good or bad, hot and cold, right and wrong, religion and science. To once again become harmonious with each other and the planet, we have to learn to understand again from the left brain. When this happens, we can move out of polarity consciousness into unity consciousness, and that's essentially where we're going. That about wraps it up. See you next time. Black and white thinking at its finest. You say things, and it's just word salad. Your concept is meaningless, and your conclusions highly questionable. You call yourself spirit science, and there just isn't any science. That's it for this lesson, too. And yes, I'm chopping out the end credits. If you want to see them, then it'll be on Jordan's channel. Links are below for those that have the stomach for it. If you like what we're doing here, and want to see us do more of it, please watch, like, comment and subscribe. We really do love the feedback we get, and it brightens our day when we see a commenter with a thoughtful, well-argued response. If you have a question for Destiny or I, then please make it clear who you're addressing. We will get to them as quickly as we can. This week's shout-out goes to a wonderful pitcher of poison Kool-Aid. Bane666AU. He doesn't do much in the debunking of pseudoscience, but he is a favorite voice with a lot of solid information on the INS and outs and details of both the men's rights movement and feminism. He's another computerized voice, but if you all have stuck with me this long, no doubt you're used to that. Do please give him a look.
package will be doing a short video later in the week to discuss some of the changes that have been going on, and I'll be doing my regular review later in the week. We'll be back next week with someone else for Wu Month, and we'll be opening a nominee list for the last week of Wu Month. Until next time, clear skies and happy debunking.